Welcome friends to this final event of our 2021 Summer Music Institute at St. Vladimir Seminary online. We are so glad that you have been with us these past few days and feel really grateful for the opportunity to gather together and are that much more looking forward to gathering together in person. We are very, very fortunate tonight today, this afternoon, this morning, you're all over the world. So it's all those things right now um, to have with us, to close us out, Mother Christophora, the abbess of the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, Pennsylvania. She has been with her nuns, her sisters uh, for, for many years, doing the very work that we've been talking about these past few days. and is going to present to us her experiences and her thoughts about this work uh, in her presentation, which she's titled United by a Bond of Love, Preaching the Gospel of Peace in Song. And to introduce Mother Christophora, we are very pleased to have Father Sergius, the abbot of St. Tikhon's Monastery, another fellow laborer in this extraordinary monastic calling to bring us in. So, Father Sergius. And right, Sergius, I'm the abbot of St. Tikhon's Monastery, America's oldest Orthodox monastery founded in 1905 by St. Tikhon of Moscow. Serving daily liturgy here for almost 115 years, we strive diligently to raise the bar in liturgical excellence. It is my privilege to be able to introduce our next speaker and final speaker, Mother Christophora, who is the abbess of the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, Pennsylvania. Through our common focus as monastics on the liturgical life and tradition of the church, we truly understand through the many, many years of service that we offer to the church, how difficult it is to bring forth and bear that word, that life-giving word of our tradition, which is ultimately exhibited par excellence in our musical tradition. Mother Christophora, as, as well as many monastics, understands the very difficult nature of what it means to be in church every single day, morning, evening, and possibly sometimes in the middle of the day, sometimes up to four or five hours a day, learning and being challenged by this liturgical tradition. It's only in this forge of liturgical life that truly the musical tradition of the church has been created and ultimately continues to progress in growth. As we offer our thanks to Mother Christopher for joining us, we understand the difficulties and ultimately the necessity of the monastic tradition in our Orthodox Church. Through her words, we will enter more deeply into that unity of song that is exhibited by the monastics and ultimately that gift of song that has been given to us by many monastics from many, many canonized saints that we have in our liturgical tradition. It is without further ado that I introduce Mother Christophora from the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration. May God bless her words, may God enlighten you through them, and may God help us all to continue to strive for excellency in our liturgical life and tradition. Thank you, Father Sergius, your blessing. Christ is risen. Indeed. I am very honored and very humbled to have been asked to present the closing remarks, the closing talk uh, for your wonderful gathering uh, on music and unity in the Church the Summers Institute. Um, I want to thank the presenters for your trust and your confidence in inviting me, but I want to thank especially also the participants for all of the hours that you have uh, dedicated to this weekend or end of the week conference, the presenters, and especially to all of you, choir members, leaders, directors, teachers, parish members, who take your, your responsibility uh, seriously and offer it to God in love. It's no small thing. It's no small offering at all. I'm sure uh, that in our eyes, sometimes we feel pretty crummy and pretty uh, inadequate. And we are, quite honestly, but I have no doubt that um, all of our efforts and the love that we have for the Lord and the love that we want to display by uh, 
um, serving him and our choirs um, is accepted on his altar. For my talk today, I've chosen uh, something that we, a phrase that we're familiar with from Holy Week, united by a bond of love, preaching the gospel of peace in song. United by a bond of love comes from Holy Thursday Matins Canon that we sing on Holy Wednesday night, Ode 5, uh, the following phrase, the apostles were united by a bond of love dedicated to Christ who rules over all. Their beautiful feet were washed for the preaching of the gospel of peace. That little phrase, and of course, one more earmos in a week full of Irmoi and troparia and Mysticuria may have uh, not gotten your attention. However, for us here in our monastery, someone brought it to our attention, someone whom some of you know, someone very special to us, and that was the late Matushka Juliana Schmemann. Uh, she was not a nun, you know that. She was the, the wife of Father Alexander Schmemann. But in her widow years, years of widowhood, she uh, often came to our monastery to spend part of Great Lent, Holy Week, and Pascha among the sisters. And with her personality, which was not flat in any way, but she would encourage us. We're coming tonight. The, the verse we're going to sing is come, enjoy the master's hospitality, or united by a bond of love. And uh, she, with her enthusiasm, brought these words to our hearts so that they became special to us. And I can, of course, hear her pointing them out still, even though she's gone to the Lord uh, some years ago, but her, uh, her enthusiasm is, is among us now. Where did she learn that? Most likely, she learned it from her father, who was a choir director. Growing up in Paris, in hard times, uh, but going with him to church and waiting for those special verses, and then finding herself married to Alexander Schmemann, who became then the Dean of St. Vladimir's, and being on campus, which is one of the best places to be for Holy Week, I can only assume, because you've got the best of everything there. And I'm sure she was like, spreading that enthusiasm there as she did here among us. No doubt her, 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 her enthusiasm wore off. Uh, I'm sure that we heard beginning, opening address, keynote address by Professor David Drillock, who would have been a student in those early years under Father Schmemann and have lived a long time uh, there with Matushka uh, Juliana. And I'm sure that all of that, you see, it becomes integrated into our persons. And then Father, uh, excuse me, Professor um, Drillock had um, teachers from, who came from France and from Russia, and they had it in them, and they're giving it to others. So the point is that we learn from one another, not only pitch, not only technique, musical technique, but we learn what I call spiritual appreciation, joy, mystery, enthusiasm, hope, and love. All of these things from the services. And we need to teach this, bring this to our homes. Don't just come to church cold and, well, here we are, and I guess it's this page 14 we're singing tonight, but prepare yourselves, prepare your children, prepare your family a little bit. So that, again, this is spreading and, and we're learning from one another. We influence one another more than we realize. And this forms a spiritual unity. The saying has to be true. We are safe together, but we perish alone. Otherwise, how would all of us, finding ourselves in the 21st century in this land of America, um, in front of our computer screens. How would we learn to sing to the Lord songs of the angels? Most of us have never been lifted up to the third heaven, but we learn from those who know the Lord in their hearts. 
and we have who, who have authentic experiences of him in their lives. So I was asked to present to you a little bit about, well, our monastery being a pan-Orthodox monastery using a variety of musical traditions. And to speak also about my own life growing up in the church and how uh, we apply that in what you hear today, uh, visiting our monastery or more likely uh, worshiping with us as we stream all of our services. So I'll do, I'll talk about the history of our monastery. Then I'm going to talk about my, uh, my experience growing up in the church and then come back to our monastery into when the music itself um, had a uh, more, uh, more intensive development. Uh, you may know that our monastery in Elma City, Pennsylvania was founded by a princess, Princess Ileana of Romania, known as a nun, Mother Alexandra. I cannot, I do not have time to uh, tell the story of her life, but you may read her autobiography, I Live Again, or a biography about her called Royal Monastic. Both of them have been recently, or in recent years, published by Ancient Faith Ministries. She found herself in exile from her beloved country of Romania when communist, communism took over, and eventually she found herself in the United States. She was supporting herself um, traveling around this country and speaking about the effects, the ill effects of communism on a people and on a country. She was articulate speaker and very uh, much sought. Her travel schedule that I have found in our files uh, was very, very extensive and not by the person, person parentheses, not invited by Orthodox parishes who couldn't afford such a thing, but by um, community groups and not and other um, Christian uh, denominations inviting her to speak. So she uh, completed the responsibilities to her family. Uh, she was uh, married and had six children. At some point uh, during after the war, she was divorced, and she was able then to fulfill a dream of becoming a nun. She could not go back to Romania to become a, a monastic. She was not welcome in Romania. So it was suggested to her by Metropolitan Anthony Bloom that she would join the Monastery of the Veil vale in Boussy, France. She did that. She knew English, Romanian, and French, very fluent in the three, those three languages. However, in that monastery, all of the services were in Slavonic, Church Slavonic, because the monastery was founded by nuns who immigrated from Russia during communism and so on. So she understood not a word of the services. Nevertheless, she applied herself and um, uh, worshipped as best she could in the prayer of her heart. And during that time, she came back every year uh, to, to teach at the camps, the religious education camps in, in Michigan. Well, obviously she got to know our country through her travels as a princess, through her teaching as a nun, and she knew that our country was lacking a spiritual dimension that she thought uh, orthodoxy could give. Specifically, an orthodox monastery would add much to the spiritual life of our country. And that was her dream. So her dream was to found, to establish an Orthodox monastery for women, a pan-Orthodox monastery, that all of the services would be in English. A dream. And she wanted our monastery to be celebrating on the new calendar and welcoming women from all ethnic backgrounds. That does not sound impressive in 2021. We take it for granted that we can have services in English and, and um, worship on the new calendar and so on. But in the 1960s, that was a very, very major undertaking. 
the big problem was that the services were not yet translated into English. Um, some English was starting to be used in our parishes, but that was mostly the divine liturgy. You know, for a monastery, you need all the Vesper verses, not only Saturday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, things that have to be translated. So she had a big problem, a big problem to fulfill her dream, um, especially because these services did not exist in English. And here we come to what I call a little bit of uh, sweet Orthodox trivia. Uh, I think you're all familiar with the Latin triodium, the Festomenean, translated by Mother Mary and Callisto Swear, and you're probably using these for years. The story behind that, that, that uh, is the trivia, is that these projects were started on behalf of Mother Alexandra, living in a monastery in France, with services were in Slavonic. So they were starting to translate for her just to be able to understand the Saturday night vespers and, and services like that. But the need grew and it continued so that all of the services through the whole week, the, uh, I have a little example here. So if, uh, if you want to do Tone two, when we're in the Octoicus again after Pentecost. Uh, tone one, Sunday Vespers, uh, that sort of thing. You know, the verses for Thursday, Matins, Tone eight of the Octoicus. Well, somebody had to do all of that translating. And that was typed with a typewriter on onion skin paper and slowly, uh, methodically, a bit at a time, uh, he uh, air, sent by airman to our monastery from there. So it was a huge amount of work. And I'm going to add something rather personal uh, about the translator, Mother Mary. Uh, she's deceased, but I want to share this uh, bit, another bit of trivia, Orthodox trivia with you, because it may encourage some of you. Uh, Mother Mary did all of these translations. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. And she was proficient in, in liturgical Greek and Slavonic and English because she was actually British. And she was supposed to come, the plan that she would come with Mother Alexandra to Pennsylvania to found our monastery, to begin our monastery. Uh, so there would be two, not just one. But Mother Mary, uh, her health did not permit her to come. And her illness was what was called then manic depressive disorder. Now I think it's the same thing that we refer to as bipolar disease. So in her times of this mania, this manic time of this, of this syndrome is when she would do this, these volumes of translations. And because she had energy and she wasn't sleeping and she had all this intelligence and there she was just working and working and working on these translations. At other times, at other periods, she would fall into a depression, very, very dark depression, and have to go to the hospital. I don't know what medications, if any, existed at that time for her. That would have been in the mid-60s. So I tell you this because um, in all of our families, it's very common to have this diagnosis somewhere in someone, maybe perhaps in ourselves or in someone whom we love. But it's a reminder that our Lord can use any situation, can use any circumstance, illness, weakness, frailty, and still create from that something good and something positive. Having to, uh, wishing to start an, an English, all English monastery in, in, the, in the 1960s, the late 1960s, being a Romanian princess, you can imagine that she was, um, it was a disappointment to the Romanian people. They would come to our monastery hoping to find this kind of little Romanian village or enclave of, you know, a Romanian culture. And, and they would be so disappointed in their princess that she had this, this humble monastery in the very, in the beginning, it truly, truly was humble. Um, I hope we still are humble, but the situation was humble a couple of American sisters trying to do the uh, daily services on their own in English and so on. And 
And uh, so the, the Romanian people, I'm sure, uh, told her their disappointment. Uh, nevertheless, she was very firm, very firm. She never gave in on her goal and her dream to really have a pan-Orthodox monastery for women. Now, as far as our music history, um, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty blank there in this first dozen years, 10 years or so, because actually Mother Alexander could not sing a note. I don't actually know how the services, whether they were just read um, in, those, in those founding years or what circumstances were. But the real music, um, liturgical music offering starts in 1978 when, when uh, three nuns came from Romania to help Mother Alexandra in our monastery, in developing our monastery. They had beautiful voices and they were blended like nothing you could imagine, just, just so beautiful. When I first heard that myself, um, I was totally moved by the by the beauty of their voices and the blending and and um, and how how their their harmony was was so excellent and they were singing kind of a Romanian choral uh, Byzantine style so when they sang the liturgy together it was three part but they still would chant um, verses in a Byzantine during uh, stikira and so on like that the best they could. They had, however no knowledge of the English language. Now we have a kind of reverse. We have the service text in English and the people who are asked now to sing it, the nuns coming from Romania did not know English. So it's Mother Benedicta, Mother Apollinaria, Mother Gabriella. Some of you know Mother Gabriella. She's the abbess of the monastery of the Dormition in Michigan. And Mother Benedicta started, is, is deceased, but she started that monastery and Mother Apollinaria. So the three of them, so they came here to help Mother Alexander with our monastery, and thank God they did, because it made a tremendous, tremendous uh, difference in our life. It was one of the turning points. But still, their sacrifice, imagine that. So these are deeply rooted, Ameri uh, excuse me, Orthodox to the core monastics. I think Mother Benedicta didn't know anything but monasticism, as well as Mother Gabriel and Mother Apollinaria, because all three of them entered the monastery as very, very, very young women. And now they're in this uh, totally different country uh, of America, not knowing the language. They get to our monastery and they're told by Mother Alexandra, all of the services here are in English. So the story that Mother Alexandra, uh, excuse me, Mother Benedicta tells, uh, would tell that she and um, Mother Gabriella, who was then called Sister Burika, the, the night they arrived, they stayed up all night with dictionaries, looking up every word. Like, in other words, if you had to read the third hour tomorrow morning in a language you don't know, but it uses the same alphabet, so you could say maybe Spanish, it's, it's, a, it's a Latin alphabet, Romanian, so at least they knew the alphabet, but they didn't know the sound of the alphabet. So they stayed up all night with the dictionaries, looking up these words, trying so they could be prepared to pray in the morning in English. And that kind of effort, as well as for years, just um, having to, to worship in a, in a foreign tongue. Again, it's kind of the reverse. Now they're, uh, they're the Orthodox people who know the service so well, but they have to execute. And they're, they're singing in a language that is not their own. So they're very challenged in that, very challenged by that. Uh, but they were helped in this situation, Father Roman Braga. Uh, hopefully you've heard of Father Roman Braga. Uh, he was um, Mother Benedict's brother. He was imprisoned in Romania and uh, eventually exiled and eventually found himself in America. That's another very interesting story. But he was very musical. No um, surprise having the name Roman from birth. And he had quite a capacity um, of for putting the Romanian chant into English. And he did a lot of that. He was working for Archbishop Valerian um, at the Vatra, putting these things into English. Um, and it, he composed actually a, a congregational kind of singing liturgy for the Romanian diocese, Romanian Episcopate. It was very, very beautiful, very melodic. And uh, he found himself here at our monastery as our chaplain um, in 1983. And he had a very, very uh, beautiful voice, 
singing, but also serving, which is interesting because I, as a young novice, uh, I'll be talking more about myself a little later, but at that time we used to have uh, matins at 10 o'clock at night. So 10 starting 10 o'clock every night until about 11.30, uh, that was the time that the Romanians, they, they did matins at night, so rather than starting at midnight, which they probably did in Romania, uh, they lessen that expectation to 10 p.m. It still was hard, very hard. Uh, and we would kind of be tired and uh, I don't know what. Um, but Father, with his beautiful voice, he would take a pitch for the litany that just would just lift everybody up. So he knew how to use these different things that we have available to us, different gifts from God. And there we were, suddenly snapped back into, into raising our voices, raising our hearts, raising our minds to the Lord. But he had an openness also to the American culture, to the American way, as well as to the music that Americans are used to, which is probably for most of us kind of a four part harmony. And he was sensitive to that. So he has the, the, the nuns from Romania used to Byzantine chant. And then people like myself used to um, what's used in our OCA parishes, a kind of obicod tones and so on. So I'll pause here to speak a little bit more about myself and then we'll come back to our monastery. I was uh, born in an Orthodox family, raised in the Orthodox faith. My four grandparents uh, immigrated from Eastern Europe, from Galicia, probably in their home uh, villages. I suppose their churches were probably under the Unia uh, because that's part of history, but here in America, they were uh, belonging to our Orthodox parishes, the Metropolia, parishes of the Metropolia. And uh, my paternal grandparents were actually married by St. Alexis Toth. So that's my claim to fame. Um, I was raised in a small town uh, called Lopez, Pennsylvania. And uh, I'd like to tell people I'm from the other St. Vladimir's because our church in Lopez uh, was dedicated to St. Vladimir. Now, as I understand it in this uh, small kind of mining, coal mining town, hardworking people, all the families had lots of children. Uh, so the parish probably had a pretty good population. I'm maybe 200 at that time, I don't know, like in my parents' childhood. But as I understand it in that time, full time, the parish, even that small parish, had a full, excuse me, full-time choir director, music director, cantor, singer, uh, and he was referred to as prof. And I understand he was very strict in his uh, directing, choir rehearsals, and so on. And he trained that choir very well. But um, you know, now it seems like a uh, something rare to have a, a paid choir director, and to think that. That, that was known as part of, of the structure of a parish. You need a priest, you need a choir director, and you pay for both. You probably paid very little. Um, that's perhaps another story based on economics, but they recognize the need for that. And I would say uh, that, I think you're all going to agree with me, that we have to uh, invest more time and training and money into, uh, into the music of our parishes. It's such a major part of Orthodox worship. I'm preaching now to the choir, literally. Um, you can't have Orthodox worship without a choir, without somebody who knows the music. And, and we have really have to um, uh, provide that for the, for the worshiping uh, uh, body of Christ, as well as for those who might happen to, to visit our parishes. So workshops such as this um, are excellent, needed, and um, should be funded. Uh, and the next step, of course, would be to convince our parish councils and the parish administration that to have, uh, no, to be appropriately organized as a parish, to offer, um, services on the caliber of beauty, which they should be, because you can't, you can't separate orthodoxy from beauty. You can't separate orthodoxy from music. 
but worship from music. So um, I'm available to speak to your parish councils because, <laughs> but you know, we, we should, it's a full-time job and you know that too. If you really work on organizing your parish, but also that your, that your music, and I took a little uh, look at Nicholas Reeves' workshop where he's, he puts this together and this together so that when everybody comes on Saturday night, there's no fussing with those pages. And well, that's a lot of work for a choir director. That makes it really a full-time job. Okay, I'm back to my, ah, get off of that uh, soapbox, right? Okay, so the point is that even though we were a small parish in a rural area, we had a well-trained choir. When I was a child, um, our choir director was very, very talented musician, Matushka Valerie Sudik, her husband was our parish priest, excellent priest, Father Yaroslav Sudik. And um, she worked very hard with the adult choir, but she also uh, started, organized a junior choir, of which I was the youngest member. Um, and I don't regret that because I've been singing in church ever since, you know, so we have to open up opportunities to our children. Um, let, them, let them taste the sweet honey of the Orthodox services so that they will get addicted. It's not a bad addiction to have that you like to go to church and sing, uh, but we have to feed that. We have to feed that hunger. And, and uh, so this is what I had to do. Uh, the choir of junior choir was singing Vespers Saturday night and the night eves of certain feasts. We had to sing Gospodi Bozvak, Blaže Muž, Svete Tihi. Everything was in Slavonic. She wasn't teaching these children just to sing, which would have been a little easier if we were singing in English but she had to teach us to sing and to chant in Slavonic. Um, we had to learn the Trisagian prayers. The first time I learned them, the first time I said them in church, I had to, we all had to chant them and we had to chant them in Slavonic. So of course I can still do that. Sveti Bože, Sveti Krepi, Sveti Vesvedni pomilaj nas. Sveti Bože, Sveti Krepi, Sveti Vesvedni pomilaj nas. So she taught us the style, taught us the pronunciation, and taught us how to do that. I am not proposing that you start a junior choir using Slavonic. It's just that the services at that time in 1961, 62, they were still in Slavonic. So she, they, we were doing what we were doing. That's how church sounded. When you went to church, that's how it sounded. You had no idea what the, what the sound, what the words that sound, what they meant. Actually, we never even asked, but that's another story. <laughs> Uh, but but it was all part of the soul. See, it's all going in, going in and creating something in, in ethos there at Orthodox from Nima. So um, we learned to do this. I think the first time I did the Trisagian prayers was at, on the eve of St. Nicholas, maybe my seventh or eighth birthday, because that's when I celebrate my birthday. But also when I was in the senior choir, the adult choir, much of our choir rehearsal, uh, which we had frequently and around the piano and four part and so on, because the choir was still large then when I was in uh, like, like my early teens. But much of our choir rehearsal time was pronouncing the Slavonic words, learning how to pronounce them. Not what they said, but learning how to pronounce them. Well, the point of all this, again, I'm not asking you to start a junior choir using uh, Russian or Slavonic or use English, but the point of this is that children will respond and they actually are extremely capable, much more capable than we give them credit for, and they will do what we ask them to do. So don't lower the bar. You know, expect a lot from them and they can do it. Actually, they'll be very glad to do it and they'll feel good and, and okay, that's my other sort of thing, but uh, what kind of singing, what kind of music, of course, it was the obiquo tones, Russian melodies. Uh, and um, by the way, when I've traveled as a nun singing uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a Slavic country with nuns who still sing Slavonic, 
they would tell me, you have very good pronunciation. And I always, I know the reason for that, because of that choir where I was learned to sing as a child. And before I was born, that choir was very well trained and it didn't go away. So my pronunciation is not because I studied the language or practiced it. I was just, it was, I was taught well. Uh, so that's that's a, not a praise of me, but a praise of, of the talent that existed in the effort that existed in the choir uh, before me. I also had the opportunity or the necessity as a teenager and a young college student to sing many of the services by myself. A vesper on Saturday night, sometimes I would sing by myself, or a Saturday liturgy during Lent. Uh, maybe myself and one or two ladies, we would sing, but sometimes I was singing by myself. And that's also a very good experience. You learned that during the pandemic. Korea, Mantushka, Presbyteri, she found herself, Pratessa found herself to be the choir, uh, you know, when only Father and the Presbyter could be in church and maybe one altar server. So it's a good experience. Sing a liturgy by yourself. Um, I was exposed, uh, besides my parish, to St. Tikhon's Monastery and Seminary in my teenage and young adult years. My brother went there to seminary, and I loved going to visit and look at all those handsome young men and hear them singing. Uh, you know, they were still singing in Slavonic, beautiful choir. Father Dan Kabalik was one of the directors and, and uh, others, but they're awesome. There's beautiful sound, but again, it's all in Slavonic. And they were teaching on uh, reading on the Kleros and Slavonic. That's not so long ago, at least because it's in my lifetime, I think it's not long ago. That would have been in the 70s, early 70s. Um, I, uh, I had also the opportunity to say this because I know uh, we like to find new ways to, to learn the choir directing skills, uh, but there was a course at St. Tikhon Seminary uh, when I was a young adult that I took, it was one night a week. Father Theodore Heckman taught the music half of the evening course and Father Stefan Mahalik taught the second half of the evening course, which was liturgics. And it was really a wonderful um, course. It went on for a semester, one night a week. I don't remember the time, maybe 6.30 to 8.30, I don't remember, but I drove and I took that course. And so that's just an idea uh, using now Zoom and all these other things that I think we could probably offer something like that uh, one night a week. Um, so as a working uh, person in my 20s, I was living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, part of the wonderful choir um, in Christ the Savior Church, which, uh, which was just a, a really happy time for my soul because that was the choir that I remembered as a child. Now I join a choir like that in another in another parish and happy with that. Well, it was during that, that time, early 1980s, that I made my first visit to a monastery in Elwood City, having only heard Obikud, uh, Russian chant music. And then I come here, uh, a very quiet Friday morning for a service when I was in the area. And I heard this ah, beautiful sound from just a few sisters. And it was a, a subdued service on early in the morning. And, and I don't know, just a few sisters singing. I was like, wow, how could they sound so beautiful? Just a few, just a few voices. And well, that's when I was uh, smitten really by the sound of the, of these melodies that the Romanian, I don't you know, really call it Byzantine chant because uh, that's the difference between the Greek Byzantine, I think. I find the Romanian much more melodic and much more sweet. So I heard these sweet voices. <clears throat> I want to give you just one example before I enter into the third section of my talk. Uh, we just finished the Feast of Mid-Pentecost. If you are a member of the uh, Orthodox Church in America or the Slavic uh, uh, tradition, uh, Russian tradition in church, you know Tone 8, Mid-Pentecost Feast, Jopar. In the middle of the feast, O Savior, fill my thirsting soul with waters of godliness. And that's how it goes. And if you're singing alone, because that's all that's in church that night, or you're singing at home, it's, it's okay, but it's not particularly beautiful. But let me sing a the first few phrases in how we sing it here, in the Byzantine uh, that Father Roman uh, gave us in English. 
In the middle of the feast, O Savior, fill my thirsting soul with the waters of godliness. To me, that's, it speaks to the words, the soul is lifted and encompasses the words. It, all, it works so well, in my opinion. Okay, but it wasn't all rosy. Because now I'm turning from my life back to the music here in our monastery. Now I enter, I join the monastery two years after my first visit in 1983. It's a little different being a sister than being a guest. And everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. So there's some growing pains that we have to go through. So uh, as I told you, I found the liturgy uh, here being a song here, very beautiful. But when I got to the Lord, I crossed the Kira, particularly tone two and tone six. I couldn't stand them. They were so foreign to my ears. Um, and then, uh, but my real crisis, because those tones only come up every so often, my real crisis was my first Pascha in the monastery. Now, there's something about music and our souls and our hearts that we can't really disjoint them. It's all kind of wrapped around each other because it's, it's uh, assimilated, right? So think of Pascha night in the Russian Slavic parish. Well, here we go, folks, right? We're like jumping out of our skin with excitement and joy and melodies of all sorts of harmonies and, and charm and high notes and low notes and stumping notes and singing notes and you know that's pasca and i was used to uh, i never had pasca in a greek church or, or a byzantine you know style uh, so i was i was really really pained because here we are God bless our nuns. They couldn't just transfer what they, they could sing, I'm sure, very beautifully, these, these uh, uh, earmos of the canon and verses of the canon in, in Romanian. But to put that into English that night by themselves, you know, they couldn't do it. So there was a, an attempt, Father Roman would sing one verse and then one of the nuns, and, but it was so slow. And well, I can kind of understand it was slow. They're trying to figure it out or, or do it. Uh, but our music on Pasta Night and in in, in what I was used to was like so fast and so vibrant. And so here we are, Pasta Night, and, and I'm hearing, uh, maybe I shouldn't tell you this story. I'm not sure I need to, but we're halfway through it, right? I better finish it. Um, so I'm looking around, and the first earmost is like this. The day of resurrection, let us be illumined, O oh people. Illumined? Where is the illumined here? You know, and then we get to let God arise. And you know that in, in, the, in, our, in our Slavic way. I'm sorry. So here we are doing a little bit different. And I'm looking around. And then there's one phrase in our translation that was used here, let us reflect the feast. And everybody's kind of holding their candle, it's dripping, they're hanging on. I'm sorry, it, but I don't say this to be critical. I say this to tell you that if you are introducing a new type of music into your choir, go slowly, go slowly. Let people learn to appreciate a little bit at a time because otherwise you're gonna crush their spirit. So my, crush, my spirit was crushed, but I needed that spirit. I needed that. And I survived it. I'm still telling the story. You know, life goes on and now we use other melodies and we have a choir director and it's all very good. Um, but we have, we go through these things. So we have to be patient with one another and respect one another and taste, just taste a little bit of other traditions, which is, I know what you're doing this weekend or this week, you're doing that on purpose. But I would say for parents, a good, one of the many gifts you can give your children, take them to parishes of other traditions. From time to time, once a year, twice a year, go from time to time to an Antiochian church, to an OCA church, to a Greek church, to a Serbian church. Let them hear others' music. 
taste other foods, learn the orthodoxy. These people are orthodox too. You know, this town of Elwood City, 10,000 people, uh, we have three orthodox parishes and one monastery. Well, those three Orthodox parishes were started a hundred and some years ago from different ethnic groups coming over from Europe, Carpatho-Russian, Romanian, and then Metropolia, uh, Russian Metropolia Parish, OCA. Uh, we can say that, oh, didn't they all understand they were the same church? No, they probably didn't. And we still make that mistake. So uh, yeah, let your children hear and taste and respect it. Don't leave the church in the car like I would say, oh, I couldn't stand that. Because, no, you have to do that. Oh, that had a beauty in itself, right? So I'm saying, encouraging that. Because when they leave home, if they've only been in their home parish and they go to a OCF or they go to a church near their college and it's not the same jurisdiction, or maybe it is the same jurisdiction, still not singing the same hymns, they'll have a crisis. And that just happened this week. True story. This past week, we received an email from a young woman in college who wants to convert to orthodoxy. Serious young woman. She goes to OCF. She goes to the local Orthodox parish. At the OCF, the majority of students are from an ethnic group. She did not name it. Doesn't matter because it could happen. But there's enough of them that they they understand each other. They believe that's the way orthodoxy is. And so they keep their ethnic ethnicity. It's amazing. These are 18, 19 year old kids. I'm sure they were not born overseas, but their parish, you know, it formed their soul. And so she's having a hard time breaking in. They're having a hard time breaking out. Uh, but for the sake of a unified orthodox church in our country, let's expand. Okay, I have uh, taken a lot of my time. Uh, Father Roman did our music in, in English and he did that uh, without a piano from memory. I don't know how, but he wrote many, many scores of music for us. Katavasia, ex apostolary that we still sing. The Romanian nuns eventually left here and started a monastery, as you know, Romanian monastery. Uh, uh, they wanted to start that for Romanian immigrants, but uh, in Michigan, and it started to be in Michigan. So we were here, a few American sisters, Father Roman, and we're trying to pick up the pieces, but Father Roman was sensitive. So he blessed us, he encouraged us to use the OCA uh, parish music that we all knew. Mother Xenia was our, uh, I made her our choir director when she joined in the 80s and she introduced Podobins, Carpetho Russian chant and other, other types of music uh, that we learned and so that we um, expanded uh, our repertoire. And um, uh, when she became sick and she passed away, she's no longer here. Uh, we were back to kind of nobody trying to music. I have a strong voice. I've been singing all my life, so the sisters would simply follow my voice. And that was not ideal. That went on for a long time until, uh, so I felt like Mother Goose and the ducklings, you know, like I had to sing louder and softer I would sing, the softer they would sing, so whatever. We, we worshiped the Lord the best we could. But Mother Seraphima arrived about 10 or so years ago with a music background coming from a a musical family, and I have uh, given her the obedience to fix all of this. So she's it's taking her a while, but and we've had some voice lessons. We've had the Sheans here for lessons, Tamara Cohen, and so the, the the point is that we have to have unity, and we have unity through music. That's kind of the topic I'm supposed to be um, uh, reminding us of. But like it or not, in a monastic community, we live together. We eat together, we pray together, we sing together three times a day, and we take communion together. Well, that's a lot of things to unify us. It does work. People ask me, oh, you must rehearse a lot. We rehearse for certain times of the year, certain feasts. But the answer to that is actually we sing together three times a year. I mean, excuse me, three times a day. Yeah, three times a year. We sing together three times a year. That creates a lot of practice in by nature. So you know, priests love to serve here. Why? Because they walk in and, and we're like we're warmed up, not just because we warmed up that morning, but we're warmed up all the time. We, we sing together. So the priests appreciate that. I can only imagine in a parish, when you sang that last Amen as a choir, 
if you can remember March 2020, <laughs> maybe you're back as a choir now, I hope, but um, typically it would be a weekly cycle where the choir members would come Sunday morning, sing a whole liturgy, sing amen, go home. Maybe they didn't sing another note the rest of the week. They certainly didn't sing together unless you had a, a weekday vesper or a Saturday vesper. So um, we have at least that, that, that uh, blessing and it does unify us. It does uh, bring us together and singing together as a choir is, is one of the only things actually that we all work on. Uh, we don't all sew together, we don't all whatever garden together, but we, we do sing and worship together. So that creates unity. Uh, like it or not, I think it's just by nature it creates unity. I thank you for your time. I'm asking now Mother Serafima to top off this talk with some specific things to those of you interested in specific choir directing kind of things like what music she found works for us, how she discovered that, and uh, whatever else she wants to share, just to kind of be the, to, to bring it up to the moment. So as Mother Christophora said, and expressed very diversely, we have quite a set of music that we sing and that we've inherited, and now also incorporated over the past 10 years or so, 12 years. We regularly include in our repertoire, of course, these Romanian harmonized and more Byzantine chants and Slavic chants and Carpathian Russian and simple Byzantine hymns. And they're usually the ones that are much more closely related to the Western scale, not tone two or tone six. <laughs> we currently have sisters in the monastery that come from the Romanian Episcopate the OCA, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, and the Antiochian Archdiocese, and the Western Rite. And we have American converts with roots back to the Mayflower, American children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of Orthodox immigrants, and a German immigrant. As Mother Christophora spoke about, we've already inherited this Romanian and now Slavic liturgical traditions. Mother has given me, personally, a lot of room to expand our music based on what would work for our choir. Some ways that I looked for other music when I was a new sister were by asking these questions. What did I miss singing? What did some of the other sisters miss singing from a parish they left? What is our choir capable of? What will best convey the meaning of the text and the ethos of the monastery? It was definitely not as systematic as I just listed. But those questions were in the back of my mind as I listened to church music, received pieces of music from conferences or visiting guests, and searched through music books and online sources, whatever I could find. I do experiment with my choir when we can have choir practice, and we do have several hymns that I've decided won't work at this time for our choir. Maybe never at all that I've put aside or some that I say, well, maybe we can come back to these eventually. And they do remain in my choir practice folder. The longer I'm here, the more particular I become before I introduce a new piece of music. One of our monastery's spiritual fathers, Father Alexander of Blessed Memory, told me that I needed to help preserve some of the podobni, the special melodies, specifically referring to those in the Slavic tradition. And we have added several to our repertoire. However, moving forward, I really want to focus these with two-part chant rather than singing three parts of the four-part chants. The most recent one we learned was tone eight, what shall we call you, which I set for the phrases of the North American saints. And to give you a time frame, I think I set this two or three years ago, and we still have to learn how to sing that from text for other times of the year. So be patient. Our choir, obviously, is all women. Some of us read music. Some have been singing all our lives. Some of us have been involved in the musical arts for all our life. Others grew up being told they weren't singers. Ability aside, my choir basically consists of soprano twos and altos. Our range on a good day is limited from the F below middle C to the F above high C, but my sopranos would really prefer if they didn't have to sing anything higher than a D. In terms of musical selections for a particular service or divine liturgy, some of that depends on how much of a particular service is ingrained in the hearts of us here. For example, you will find our Vespers of Holy Friday 
very typically Russian OCA style. Well, the earlier hymns of Holy Week, we usually have both a Romanian and a Slavic setting of the music. But the lamentations on Friday evening, on Holy Friday evening, are done in the Byzantine style that most Antiochians and Greeks would be used to hearing. Another factor in my choosing music is what priest we will have serving for us. We have clergy that serve us from the OCA, the Romanian, Antiochian, Greek, and Serbian traditions. This year, we did our best to learn a Serbian Treparian of the Nativity out of love for the Serbian priest that was serving us for the feast. And sometimes we sing a Greek or Romanian or Slavonic hymn to make visiting guests feel more welcome. We often do this at more honorable or the litany after the gospel that is easier to sing in multiple languages. Mother asked me to speak about some music that has enlivened us as a community. One of the things I think that enlivened us as a sisterhood was the introduction of some two-part Slavic chants. We learned a two-part Kievan chant set of the eight tones that was actually set by Benedict Sheehan and Nicholas Reeves. I had learned these in college where Nick Reeves' father was the priest and our OCF chaplain, and they work really well with our voices. I recall some of the sisters mentioning that they understood better the meaning of the text with the two-part harmony. There was less harmonic filler, so the text became more reachable. I will say that we average less than one tone per year, so it takes time and patience and a long-term commitment. I have adapted some two-part antiphons from the Divine Liturgy book that St. Tikhon's recently published, and most recently we learned of a long gladsome life, which I put in only two parts. I think most of the sisters appreciate the two-part text more because they are simple, open, and calm, and have a melodic sound. I believe that the process of singing together and learning new music helps build the choir and the community as a whole. The variety has brought us together because we each come to appreciate what enlivens the other's heart. I could go on for a while, but one thing that stands out to me with building community through our choir is the following. The Byzantine tradition has a great love for the paraklesi service. It was hard for us to get through that every day during the Dormition fast. It was one of the things Mother Christophora first asked me to help us learn better. One day she gave me a CD of some Polish nuns singing the Paraklesis in a variation of the Slavic tone eight canon tone, saying that it spoke to her heart more than the Byzantine. After some years, I was finally able to set that into English and teach it to the choir. And it was actually harder than teaching them the Byzantine version that we have. But I think in the end, more of us came to love both versions and appreciate the Dormition fast that much more as a result. To wrap things up, I'd like to share with you some struggles and encouragement. When I first started directing the monastic choir, I was not to give any pitches. Mother Christophora said she'd start, and then I could start directing. Those of you who are choir directors might be cringing at this. It was a struggle for me at the beginning, being the youngest novice, suddenly in charge of a choir that was previously directed, as Mother mentioned, with her as the abbess leading and the nuns following long like ducklings. I share this not because I recommend it, but because of what it taught me. Even though I was tasked with directing and leading the choir, I also had to learn and absorb the ethos of the monastery. Little by little, I gave pitches at choir practice, then for gladsome light or stikira obikod ton three. Slowly, quietly, it became more regular with each new piece we learned. And not only did I have to learn the ethos of the monastery, but the nuns who had been following the abbess voice for 20 years had to slowly unlearn that style, again, so as not to disrupt the unity that was already established, but to organically make the change. Another challenge for me was to learn the cadences and abilities of the serving clergy. As I said, we have many who serve regularly, especially in the monastery. But I think in all parishes, the rhythm between the priest or deacon and the choir needs to be cultivated. Not all directors agree with me, but when possible, I take my pitch from the priest, especially for the litanies. Yes, ideally they would take my pitch, but not all have that ability, and we serve with a wide variety of priests. 
It takes some time for a new director how to learn how to give a pitch so that the choir can come in with the amen or Lord have mercy with a natural rhythm and not following what maybe we could call it a fermata rest. I knew then, I knew when I wanted to sing the amen, but I had to find the pitch, which usually wasn't in the key with the notes that were on the page, give the pitch, move my arms and breathe. And I had to learn this to do this with different priests and different keys. I knew if I didn't absorb the rhythm of the nuns correctly, they would already breathe together naturally and sing the amen whether I was ready or not as the director. One thing that helped me as a director, and I think I did this subconsciously, was to find where the priest hit the tonic of the scale earlier than the last note in his cadence at the end of a petitioner prayer. This gave me four or five more beats to prepare the proper response. Many of you can probably relate to the struggles in your own way. So I want to share a few words of encouragement. As Mother Christophora mentioned, Matuska Juliana visiting our monastery often and sort of becoming a spiritual mother to us, she often liked to give me directing advice, not on hand motions or gestures, but on the theological content of the piece of music and the psychology of the soul for a particular feast. One thing that struck, stuck with me from her was this short saying, just turn the page. Basically, if I made a mistake or I didn't know how the choir would, I didn't like how the choir responded to me or whatever was taking my mind away from the liturgy, when you turn the page, leave it all behind on the page you turned and be in the present. She also made sure to impress upon me during her visits here, the importance of continually needing to work to keep the community together as one through music. Just because you have the unity doesn't mean you don't need to keep working at it. And we, we work with who we have, and that changes over time. We added two new sisters this past year after essentially being the same eight voices for five or six years. How better to unite the new voices in our bond of love than our singing and dedication to Christ who rules over all. So when I come into the church and venerate the icons, we have one of St. Elizabeth, the new martyr and grand duchess, who is actually a relative of our foundress, Mother Alexandra. I pray to her for the choir and the sisterhood using the quote on her scroll, be close to each other as one single soul, wholly devoted to the Lord. And now we have the sisters here with us. <laughs> to share with you some live choral music. I thought we'd share a small selection of the 22 versions of Christ is Risen that we sing during this Paschal season. They will include Greek, Carpatho-Russian, Aleut, German, which was sent to us in Gregorian Neumes by Orthodox monks in Germany and transcribed by a friend into Western notation. I apologize we aren't able to sing the syncopated middle part, so we only sing the top and bottom parts, but that's what we can do. A Romanian setting, a setting from the monks formerly in Hiram, Ohio, to the Protestant hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, and the last of the three of Vlad, from Vlad Morrison's American folk melody. I think he left it. Christos, Lord,
risen. Thank you so, so much, sisters and mothers of the community. As someone just wrote in the chat, after speaking about singing for three days, it was such a joy to hear it. Um, and for all the blessings of a Zoom meeting that brings together people from around the globe, uh, we would have loved to sing together. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, sisters and mothers. Thank you also, Mother Serafima, for your informative coda to uh, Mother Christophora's remarks. And thank you, Mother Christophora. You gave us so much today and you grounded your remarks so deeply within your own lived experience and that gave flesh to your words. Uh, which encourage patience and love as we sing within our own communities and as we visit other communities to witness the blessed diversity of practices and traditions and sounds uh, within the Orthodox world. As a community, you live that diversity and by God's grace and by your leadership, uh, Reverend Mother, uh, you also embody that patience and love I walked a few times with St. Sophroni of Essex in the 1980s visiting the monastery. And as we walked past the house where the fathers live, there's a mosaic um, and enshrined in that mosaic is the psalmic verse, uh, behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in, muni in unity. And he, as we walked past it, he pointed to that verse and he said, that is the most difficult thing. Uh, and that always remained with me. Uh, if you'll bear with me just another couple of minutes, um, 
we come to the close of our three days of events and uh, I'd like to offer some words of gratitude and that's partly because that's one of my favorite things to do in the world is to offer thanks. All our gratitude goes to God with our prayers that everything that happened here, every lecture, every class, every interaction, everything that happened on the chat window, everything somehow brought us closer to each other and to our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This institute was the product of a lot of people. Uh, it emanated from our Institute of Sacred Arts. And again, I invite you to please uh, follow us and pray for us and support us in the work we're doing. Um, as I noted last night uh, after Dr. Patitsis' talk, it's been a very great joy to involve four seminaries in the Northeastern United States, St. Vladimir, St. Tikhon's, Holy Cross, and St. Nurses. And through our faculty and participants, we brought also the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration, St. Tikhon's Monastery, many musical ensembles that many of, of you represent, such as Capella Romana and others. And involving this range of people and institutions is nothing but joy when we can unite together over liturgical music it is truly an embodiment of our theme unity in the church through song so thanks be to god i'd like to uh, identify some of the very specific people to thank uh, the president of our seminary father chad hatfield and our dean alex didoria who are all who are both incredibly supportive of our work in the Institute of Sacred Arts and this institute in specific. Um, our marketing team, Sarah Werner, Deacon Alexander, Pradeep Hatcher, Anna Margaritino. Our tech team, Georgios Kokonas and Roman Ostash. Our CFO, Melanie Ringa, has to, had to put in a lot of extra work for this. Our keynote speakers, Dave Drillick, Bishop Daniel Findikian, Dr. Timothy Petitsas, Mother Christophora. Our faculty, John Michael Boyer, John Graham, Vlad Morrison, Danny Gerges, Tynan Davis, Tony Malioni, Benedict Sheehan, Nicholas Reeves, Juliana Woodhill. Thank you for all the care you put into the content that you delivered and for the pre-conference videos. Uh, our pop-up presenters, the same thanks goes to you for all the practical information you've given us, Father Peter Simcoe, Juliana Woodhill, Father Gregory Ely, Anastasia Sertsev, and uh, my goodness, my team, <laughs> Harrison Russin and Talia Maria Sheehan. Uh, I, it, it'd be impossible to, to describe to you the joy of our collaboration. Uh, there was not one nanosecond of discord in our uh, weeks, months of collaboration, our regular meetings. Um, a lot of hard work, especially on Talia and Harrison's part. Uh, and it was all so harmonious and so much fun and full of joy and humor and constructive ideas. And uh, if this institute was, uh, was worth it, and you'll tell us when you answer your survey, uh, it's because of this team. Uh, thank you. And thank you all participants. Uh, Mother Christophora began her remarks by appropriately recognizing your dedication of your time and energy. Uh, and it's something we don't take for granted. Thank you for your interest, your curiosity, your patience with our process, uh, and for staying with us through all these sessions. Come find us online um, <clears throat> at the seminary website and the Institute of Sacred Arts website and look for next summer's Institute next June 2022, uh, by God's grace. And again, please look for that survey that's coming to you soon by email. It's going to be important to hear from you. Um, we have, uh, by God's grace and by the generosity of the community at Holy Transfiguration, we have a closing hymn offered by the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration. Uh, it was suggested that we sing The Angel Cried. <clears throat> Everyone knows the Slavic one, but I asked Mother Serafima, rather, let's sing the one that Father Roman uh, put from the Romanian tradition into English for us. I think that will give a nice taste of his music and what we've been talking about today. Oh, <laughs> 
Oh!